Uh, November of last year, we introduced uh, to you the Christian calendar and this idea, this concept of the church seasons and how uh, there's this natural flow uh, that comes with learning about and, and even reliving, as it were, the life of Jesus and uh, looking at things that were redeemable for us. There's lots of history, there's lots of tradition behind all of this that spans you know, over a thousand years. And uh, we, we, we experienced, uh, as uh, many people have, going through the Christmas season. We went through Advent and enjoyed Christmas and uh, actually the Christmas season, which, um, believe it or not, uh, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, when we go through December, we go through the whole month of December uh, celebrating Christmas. Uh, but the reality is Christmas actually doesn't start till December 25th. And thereafter, you have the 12 days of Christmas. There's lots of history behind it. Some of this may bore you to death. Some of you might think it's completely irrelevant. Some of you actually love it. And uh, we, we've determined that we're going to follow. We're going to go through this uh, Christian calendar and as, uh, really as a tool to learn, to investigate, to understand, to come to, at the very end, at the very least, to understand what people are talking about when they talk about things like Advent or Epiphany or Theophany or... Uh, other words that are used that we don't, don't speak today. Lots of them are Latin words, uh, believe it or not. And uh, so we're going to do that. And if, you know, I realize that some of this stuff, you know, it's not a, <laughs> I, I just have to say it. Uh, it's not about being Catholic. It's not about, you know, I know some people are concerned about whether or not we're going to turn Catholic um, I'm, I'm not going to be putting ashes on anybody's foreheads anytime soon. I'm not going to... This is, you know, I just, I just want people to, to stay calm and just look at this as an opportunity to potentially actually redeem some things. Is there anything good from this? Is there something that we can learn? Really, are there things that we are missing? Uh, are we missing out on some stuff? Is this a way? Is, is, can any of this bless us? Okay. And so just continue to be patient and with an open mind as we pursue uh, learning about these traditions as uh, in so many ways they're there and we know that they're there, but we're clueless really what they're about. And so today actually is the day that across many traditions where we focus on the baptism of Jesus. Now the history behind this it's sort of complex and complicated, and there's a long history, and I was really going to talk about it. I think it's going to bore you half to death, uh, and some of you may not even be interested in it, and I'm not sure that it'll add a whole lot of value, but just know this. When you hear words like epiphany or theophany, the three, uh, the, 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 the three kings Sunday or three kings day or a little Christmas, and the baptism of Jesus has a long history where they're all really connected, okay? Um, and... Uh, some of them, some traditions have separated it all. Yesterday uh, on the calendar was a day where uh, there was Epiphany, and uh, at least in the West it's called Epiphany, and the East is called Theophany. They're both words that really mean the same thing, revealing, manifest, manifesting, although Theophany means manifesting of a God. And it all has to do with Jesus, and it all has to do with Jesus being uh, revealed as the Son of God, as the Messiah. But it's also connected to the Trinity. It's, it's long and it's complicated, and it's probably not going to have any value to you and to us today. Uh, but today, we're actually going to focus on the baptism of Jesus. And if you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 4, Mark says that John appeared in the wilderness preaching and baptizing, and he said he was preaching a baptism for the repentance of, baptisms of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus went out to John, and John baptized Jesus. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had to be baptized? If Jesus is who we say he is, would he really even need to be baptized by John? And he was. And even John himself seemed to indicate the fact that he didn't think Jesus needed to be baptized by him. In fact, John says, no, I need to be baptized by you. We got the, the order wrong here, so what's going on? Obviously, Jesus convinced John, and John baptized him. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? Was it just because God said so? Was it just because Jesus had to set an example for what we are supposed to do? 
Or maybe Jesus isn't who we think he is. So why did Jesus have to be baptized by John? And, and what did Jesus mean when he told John and convincing John, he says, listen, it is, it is fitting for us to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? Obviously, there's something in that statement that triggered something within John the Baptist where he stood back and said, okay, I'll do this. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? That's what we're going to address today. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. Fill us with grace so that we can hear with our hearts what we need today. It's in Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verses, uh, let's begin in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of of sins, and I love the way I love I have to love the way Mark writes this when he explains John appeared, and that's exactly what John did. John just simply came out of nowhere, preaching and performing what some would view as some religious ritual. And he, he, the interesting thing is, is that he is not doing this in the shadows of the temple. He appears where in the wilderness, and so this is completely just. Out of the norm for what the Israelites and what Jews would have expected, John, he's out in the wilderness where he appears. And then verse 5, and all the country of Judea. And I love this. He's not in Jerusalem. He's out in the wilderness. And so that's where everybody begins to go and meet him. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. So in other words, what he was doing was catching on. Although, although he was not in the shadows of the temple and he was not in Jerusalem where you would expect things like this to take place, where you would expect things like this to happen, people were going out to him in the wilderness. So in other words, what he was doing was catching on. Now, verse 6, John was clothed. He was clothed, not with the normal priestly garments. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. In other words, there's nothing about John that was typical. There is nothing about what John was doing, about what he was wearing that was the norm or according to protocol. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He was in the wilderness. He wasn't wearing the typical priestly garments, but yet people are coming out to him in droves. So John becomes a big deal. In fact, John was a big deal. And would you believe me if I tell you that at one point John was a bigger deal than Jesus? And in fact, John had to decrease so he could increase. And John decreased by getting his head chopped off. John was a big deal. People were coming out to him in droves, extremely popular with the people. However, John basically says this. And John, John knows his popularity. He knows what's going on. But John basically says this. You think I'm something? Wait till you see the guy who is coming after me. Look at what Mark writes. 
And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. He says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Even, notice this, even John recognizes the difference between his baptism and the baptism that is to come. And did you realize that that is the thing that distinguishes John's baptism and the baptism that was to come? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose handles I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with the water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in those days, Mark says, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, what Mark doesn't tell you is that John was fit to be tied. John had made up his mind. He was not going to baptize Jesus. And in fact, in the Greek, the language is very strong. John would have done anything to hinder Jesus' baptism. He was opposed to it. He did not want to do it. Jesus had to convince him. Jesus had to convince him otherwise. His mind was set on it. And Matthew says this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Jesus, in talking to John, this is what he tells them. Let, let it be so now. For this, for this, it is fitting for us to fulfill or accomplish all righteousness. In other words, Jesus says, I get it, I understand it, yes, you're right. But permit it right now, for this moment. Permit the superior to seem inferior. Let the superior seem inferior. It's like Jesus is telling John, listen, listen. I have a role to play, and you have a role to play. We both have roles to play in accomplishing this thing. This is the role that you have to play, and so let me play the role that I have to play in order to accomplish this. Now, what were they accomplishing? All righteousness or all justice. It's the same Greek word. Now, here's the thing that you need to remember. We're not talking about our justice. We're talking about the justice of God. And so when he talks about let it fulfill all righteousness or let it fulfill all justice, we're not talking about God getting even with people. Don't think about our judicial system when you think of justice. Justice isn't this. This is not God's justice. See, this is our justice. Our justice is this. You did me wrong. You did me wrong. And justice will be had when there is an equal consequence, when there is payback. When we get even, there's justice. And oftentimes, that's what hinders us from being able to forgive because we feel like we don't have justice. Okay? That's the reality. The justice of God, though, that is not the justice of God. God is not interested in getting even with us. He's interested in gaining victory for us. And so when he talk about the justice of God, we're talking about vindication. We're talking about victory, victory over sin, victory over death. And the thought is God vindicating us, giving us victory over sin, bringing in his kingdom. And so by Jesus doing this, by Jesus submitting to this, he is saying essentially this is how the kingdom comes with power. This king is not going to come to power through tyrannical pursuits, through threatening, through provocation, through war. This is not how it's going to happen. It's not going to happen by me wielding my power in order to captivate or conquer you. He says, no, 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 no. This kingdom is going to come to power by the superior humbling himself. Jesus came to serve and not to be served. And when Jesus does this, here's what you need to remember. Here it is. You ready? Through Jesus' baptism, he identifies himself with sinners. You have the sinless one identifying himself with sinners. And in doing so, creates a way by which we can identify with sinners the sinless. That's what Jesus' baptism does, or at least one of the things that Jesus' baptism does. Think about it. Think about it. The thought was that the Messiah would come conquering. The thought was that the Messiah would come conquering, exerting his authority and his rule, and he would rule like everyone else. But Jesus says, no, by Jesus submitting himself to this, he says, no, 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 this is not how this is going to happen. Jesus says God's kingdom will not come this way. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He is coming in humility and not pride. Not to exert his authority over men, but to die at the hands of men. And so the baptism of Jesus was a step towards 
the cross. That's what the baptism of Jesus was. A way by which we could identify with the sinless. Mark says in verse 10, And when he came up out of the water, immediately, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. There's graphic language. It's like literally split apart. The heavens were torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. The same spirit that was hovering over the face of the waters is now resting upon the Son of God. Did you see it? The heavens were split apart and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying this, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well Pleased, proclaiming him the sinless among the sinners. And in Jesus' baptism, when this happens, do you notice what you you notice what what you have here? What you have here? By the voice of heaven speaking and the spirit ascending or descending upon him, you have standing before you on the banks of the Jordan the Messiah. There's all sorts of explanations as to why Jesus was baptized. There's all sorts of ideas that we conjure up thinking about, why did Jesus get baptized? Because God said to do it, and so that's why he did it. Like, there's no real meaning or purpose behind this. Like, there was no identifying or no statements to this. No, 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 no. The baptism of Jesus, think about it. John was, and and here's the thing. John's baptism would have been viewed among the Israelites, among the Jews, as, as more of something for the Gentiles, they were, see, they were accustomed to this concept of baptism. They were accustomed to it. There's lots of rituals and cleansings and all these other things. But, but here's the thing. The thing that John was doing, a baptism for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, that was what the Gentiles needed to do. That was something that was more related to the Gentiles. But John was saying, no, you need to do this. This is for you as Jews to do this. And so you have John preaching, preaching a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. But then you have the sinless one come. Why would he do that? Why would he need to do that? And why would he say this fulfills all righteousness? Because this will bring victory. This is God's vindication. This will take us to that place where I now identify with the sinner. The sinless identifying with the sinner. Think about it. This had never ever happened before. This had never ever happened before in the history of man. The sinless one identifying with the sinner humbling himself to the position of human of us and by doing so he comes up out of the waters okay think about it he's standing on the jordan and even john will talk about this a little bit later he says listen i saw he's praying and he's coming out of the water and he stands on the jordan and john says all of a sudden i hear this voice and it's the voice of god (laughs) and he says that's him He's the one. John says, that's how I knew he was the forerunner, that I'm the forerunner. He's the one that I was pointing people to. That's how I knew who he was. Because the voice of heaven, the spirit, the spirit, it descended upon him like a dove. The voice said, that's my son. And doing so, it proclaimed him to be what? The Messiah. First and foremost, or above all else, the baptism of Jesus proclaimed him to be the Messiah. The Messiah. That's how we knew who he was. The very beginning. And in doing so, the Messiah identifies himself with his people, the sinners, the sinless, identifying himself with the sinner. But then also on this scene, did you notice what you have? And this is why in some traditions, in some traditions, I mean, this is fascinating. There's so much to this stuff, and you look at traditions and the thinking behind so much of this stuff. But this is also connected to this idea of celebrating the revelation or the revealing, the manifesting of the Trinity. Because in the scene, what do you have? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All in one picture, on one scene, right here for mankind. Right here. And so Mark says, and a voice from heaven declared, you are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. So it's obvious that Jesus did not have to be baptized by John for the same reasons that everyone else needed to be baptized by John. But yet, 
It was through his baptism that he identifies with us. His baptism was a way by which he would identify with us and provides us the way by which we identify with him. What do we mean by identify? What does that word mean? Well, the word means it has to do with when you are associated with something so much and so close that you're inseparable. That's what identify means. You're associated with something so much and so deeply. The connections run so deeply into the depths of our beings that we are inseparable from him. That's the picture. And that's why Paul says in Romans 6, 3, that we are baptized into Christ. We are baptized into his death. Therefore, we identify with him through his death. And in verse 4, he says, we were buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised to walk in a new life. And the word here has to do with habitual, going about walking to a new life. And so therefore, we identify with him through his resurrection. We identify with Christ. In verse 5, Paul goes on to say, we are united with him. Well, how? He says, in the likeness of his death and resurrection which is why Paul is going to go on later on and write a letter to the Ephesians the church in Ephesus and say things like this we are he made us alive together with Christ Ephesians 2 5 and the idea is that literally he's right there by your side inseparable and as a result he goes on to say in verse 6 of Ephesians 2 that we are raised with him and we have been we have been seated with him in the heavenlies, right there, inseparable, beside him. That's what it means to be in Christ. We identify with him. Now, all these things that we've talked about here, all these things uh, talked about presupposes some things. See, because I have this idea, and lots of Christianity, lots of people have this idea that, <clears throat> well, it's just all about baptism. It's just all about baptism. You're just preaching about baptism. How about you understand? When you go back and read what Paul says here, he says, this stuff presupposes some things. You have been raised to walk in newness of life. And the idea here is you're going about, literally walking about, habitually living a new life, a different life. And so it's not just about baptism it's about identifying with Jesus and as a result we are transformed and we are changed through this process that the this you know religious words but it is a real word called sanctification which is the transforming of ourselves of our hearts of our beings into the image of Jesus that's what this is about and so when we're raised to walk in units of life it presupposes some things and what are those things that we have an act of faith that we are growing in our faith we're working our salvation out we're growing in the grace and knowledge understand that growing how do you grow in the grace we know how to grow in knowledge at least we think we do we know how to grow in facts Growing in the grace and knowledge. In other words, growing in the power of God to be transformed and changed and to change the world around you and to help change people around you. You're growing in the grace and knowledge of God. It presupposes that you are dying to yourself. It presupposes that we are engaged in being disciples and helping to transform the hearts of others to keep the mind set on Christ. So it's not just about baptism. It's about the journey and it's about the, what, the, what, what baptism puts you on in this journey. And so the baptism of Jesus, while it identifies him with us, our baptisms identify us with him. And we have this amazing opportunity to, in so many beautiful ways, relive the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And as we are resurrected and we walk in newness of life, we work out our salvation towards this process of being transformed and changed by the grace of God. 
which is why we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. With that being said, Jesus' baptism was a way for the sinless to identify with the sinner. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And it provided a way for us to identify with him. But that identification is not just a one-time event. It's not just a one and done. It's an ongoing, every day, every moment, identifying with Jesus. Not just on a Sunday or in environments like this. But do you identify him with him when no one else is around? You know, when our true character comes out. Are we identifying with him? Are we identifying with him in those meetings where we have to engage in tension and conflict? Are we identifying with him when we have to make business deals? Are things always on the up and up? Are we more concerned about the bottom line? Are we really concerned about the people in which we have been engaged, these opportunities that we have to shine a light? Are we identifying with him whenever we're in that heated discussion with our spouses? And we want our way. Are we identifying with him whenever we're at home with our children? Are we more identifying with Facebook and social media and movies, et cetera, et cetera, where our children go, well, and do everything without us? Are we present with them? Are we identifying with him, with our neighbors? When, when we come into situations like this, are we truly identifying with him? See, Jesus is there, and he's present with us. You have been raised with him. You have been seated with him. Do you see yourself identifying with him? Are you with him? See, we think he does all the work. Oh boy, we're going to talk about work salvation now, right? <laughs> we get so confused about grace and faith and we think that we played no part. Scripture clearly says you work out your salvation. There are choices you have to make. Doesn't mean that it actually brings you redemption of the blood of Jesus. But you still have to make choices. And so are you identifying with him? Are you being a disciple? A disciple is not the idea that the master does all the work. A disciple is the idea that the master teaches you and shows you and demonstrates to you. And therefore, you become like the master. We have this idea that we can drink something and we'll be like Jesus. Or that we can say a special prayer and we'll be like Jesus. Or we sit back in our recliners and we say, oh, it's all up in my heart. But is it really? Is it really? Where are we? Where are we really? See, our lives will demonstrate what's really in our heart. So do we truly identify with him? In every moment. And I'm not talking about, you know, because, we, man, we, we get these little things going in us where it's like, man, we, 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 we'll think, we'll, we'll think, we'll think we're getting focused. And we'll think we're getting to that place where, where all right, all right, we're going to do some things and we're going we're gonna to change some things up and, and then we're going to start spending more time with our children and we're going we're gonna to focus on my relationship with my spouse and I'm going to be a better employee or employer. Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to deal with people better. And, man, we go and we do what we, we get these plans worked up. And we're good about making plans. We're horrible about doing the plans. And even if we get, get, get doing them, we'll have like a week or two. Right? That's a whole New Year's resolution thing, which you can do them if you want. But that's another discussion. We'll only get so far. See, our, one of our shepherds, Mike, Campbell likes to say, people like, people like transformation, but they don't want to do what it takes to change. And is that true with you? 
And if we're identifying with Jesus, we're not staying the same. The picture is like we're morphing in to him as one. The question is, is that the case for you? See, identifying with Jesus is not about one moment act. It's about daily choices. It's about every moment. It's about every day. It's not about when things get tough. Or well, the flip side, it's not about just when things are good, right? Because you have, we have, we're, we're two different types of people. We're really focused on Jesus when things get bad, right? And then others, when things get good, we don't need Jesus no more. And then other people only focus on Jesus when things are good. And when things get bad, what happens? We take control. We, we, we're we're, we're, we're going to handle this. We're going to do this. We don't need Jesus. Identifying with Jesus is about taking him in the good and the bad. That's what the cross is about. You think about that. The cross is a horrible thing, but yet it's the most beautiful thing. What Jesus endured, I mean, it brings us to tears. But yet, it's the best thing that's ever happened to us. That's a conflict. See, identifying with Jesus is about every moment. It's not the good and the bad. It's about every day. It's about every choice that we make. Jesus says you will know people by their fruit. You will know people by their fruit. That means people know, see, 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 we read that, we read that, we're good? Yeah, we, we, we're bad, we're really bad. Because we'll read that and we're thinking about, see, I will know you by your fruit. That means people got to know me by my fruit. See, it's not, it's, it's not just about me knowing. Oh, no, 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 no. That means if I'm going to know you by your fruit, you're going to know me by my fruit. And does my fruit stink? Jesus says you'll know people by their fruit. That means people are going to know me by my fruit. And while the act of baptism is just a part of the journey for when we truly identify with Jesus People will identify with us. People will identify with us through our love. People will identify with us through our compassion. People will, yeah, we're getting sappy. People will identify with us through our mercy. And I am glad Jesus was sappy sometimes. We will, people will identify with us because of who we are as his disciple, our gentleness our patience, our humility, our meekness. Those are all the things it took for Jesus to identify with us through his baptism. And those are all the things it's gonna take for others to identify with us and by identifying with us, identify to Jesus. They see him through us. So the question is, do you identify with him? Have you identified yourself with him? And if you have, do you continuously identify yourself with him? Have you put on Christ and do you keep him on? What does that mean? What does that look like for you? See, when Jesus came and submitted himself to John's baptism, he identified himself with us the sinless with the sinner. And by doing so, provided us a way to identify with him, the sinner with the sinless. And the most beautiful thing, I believe, about Jesus' baptism is the fact Jesus didn't need John's baptism not for the reasons John was baptizing, but he needed it for the world. It was through his baptism. It was shown for him to be the Messiah. It is the reason why John was able to say, that's the one that I was talking about. You think I'm special? Look at this guy. This guy. And as a result, Isaiah's prophecy has come true, right, Bill? The Gentiles in him have hope. The servant of Yahweh, 
Victory at the cross. Justice preached to the Gentiles. Do you identify with him? Are you his disciple? Is he your teacher? If not, are you ready to identify with him? If you say that you're a Christian, is this a one and done thing? And do you feel like you come and that you participate and halfway engage because it's his obligation? Or are you all in? <laughs> if you're going to identify with Jesus, you've got to be all in. There's no fence straddlers here. It's all in. And unfortunately, that seems radical to us. But that should be the norm. So the question is, do you identify with him? Are you ready to identify with him? Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that we have this picture of the baptism of Jesus the sinless one coming to this world. And if anything, he would have been the one to purify the waters. The waters did not purify him. And we have this amazing picture of how we can identify with him. His death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what baptism is to us. What an amazing picture, something tangible that we can reach out and participate. It's an act that we can full heartedly with our mind, with our body, with our emotions, with our senses engage in and really feel and know that we are a part of the sinless one. And as amazing as that is, Father, too often times as, as, as your apostles wrote in Scripture, for those who put Christ on, had to be reminded to put off the old self and to, to bring in the newness. For we, we cannot do this alone. We need your grace. We need your power to become like your son. And so for this, we cry out, Abba, Father. For there is none like you. Not a single one of us can do what you do. So we need your help each and every day as we walk, as we live, as we communicate, as we respond, as we make choices. May it forever be upon our minds that not only do we have a Savior who knows what it's like to be us, he also knows what it's like to be what we want to become. We need grace. Speak to us now. Fill us with what we need so that we might identify with you in every moment, every breath that we take. It's in Jesus we pray.